My name is Dalton Brink, and this is the Gift of Trey. A nuclear reactor is nothing more than a glorified water heater. Sailors as young as 19, kids, bombard uranium atoms with neutrons until the binding energy of the atom is no longer able to hold it together. When it finally rips at the seams, it throws energy, heat, kinetically agitated neutrons which strike more atoms and keep the reaction going. Inside the core, we've planted the enriched fuel in such a way that we can control the reaction, but new elements are created in the process, venomous isotopes which will outlive us for hundreds upon hundreds of generations. When time has wrought language obsolete, when it's split the cities from their foundations, the Frankenstein elements will still hurl packets of energy into the dark so that they can rest once again. We entomb them someplace where no one can reach them, where time may work its healing. Monoliths, literal pillars of stone adorned with skulls and lightning bolts are designed in a gracious effort to keep our future selves at bay. All this simply to heat water. We're kids with matches and an endless supply of gasoline. My watch team at the Nuclear Plant has been operating rotating shifts for nearly seven months now, simulating what life beneath the sea shoved into a tin can submarine will be like. A place where the hours of the day have no bearing, where sunlight has no relevance, a place where sleep will be a luxury and stress a constant companion. I worked noon to midnight one week, then daybreak to sundown the next, and then graveyard to noon the next in an ever-revolving, never-failing pattern of lost memory and fuzzy intentions. I stand watch in the engine room of the submarine, quite literally on blocks located in the center of a forest in the middle of nowhere upstate in New York, far from everything and everyone I've ever known. It took me a year and a half to finish the theoretical classroom portion of my training in the swamps of South Carolina, and now I'm here to receive my working knowledge of the planet itself, the boiling, unsympathetic heart of the submarine where atoms slam together endlessly, releasing their heat for us to capture. I've been floating for weeks now, that's what it feels like, floating. Like I'm inside a bubble where all my senses are subdued, where light and sound and taste and touch and smell all pass through some kind of foggy membrane. When I wake for the next shift, my room is very dark. The windows I've covered over with aluminum foil and heavy blankets to seal out daylight. The steady drone of white noise from the television blocks all outside sounds. There's a numbness which invades my every cell. This world I find myself in, a system of autonomic duty, lays waste to individual freedom of all kinds. My thoughts are not my thoughts. My deeds are not my own. My duty is another's. When I finally pull myself from the bed, the alarm having screamed at me for 20 minutes, I make my way through the unadorned hallway and into the small bathroom I share with a couple other sailors. I stare at the young man in the mirror without turning on the light, the day streaming in through the window enough to cause me to wince. I look him over. Large ears, dark brows nearly joined at the nose's bridge, sharpness of the cheekbones, I hardly recognize him. Between schools, I was granted leave. I went home to Mississippi for the first time since I joined up. My father hosted a barbecue, inviting his enormous Catholic family. My uncles were there, a few of my aunts, and a dozen so cousins, including Trey, a close friend as well as a cousin, born on the same day I was, making us the same age. Trey had recently been discharged from 107th Infantry, the Rakasans. He'd been embedded with the first surge of troops in Afghanistan and later Iraq for the ousting of Saddam. I haven't seen him for a couple of years and only heard faint hearsay of what he'd been doing with his newfound freedom. Trey and I sat together on the front peaks. Trey and I sat together on the porch swing at the back of the house overlooking the forest running the opposite direction. His normally healthy face was drawn taut dark rings around his eyes. He'd lost weight since I'd seen him last. How sings, Trey? 
Ah, man, you know, I'll never better, he said, smiling sarcastically, exhaling blue cigarette smoke between gritted teeth. He told me of his new place out in the country in Holly Springs, Mississippi. He bought a trailer on a few acres of land all to himself and his wife. Horses and chickens ran the place. He raised fighting cocks for money and for his own entertainment. He raised pit bulls as well. I had to shoot one of my studs the other day, he told me. He was growling and acting crazy with a neighbor boy, so I cut his head off and hung it in a tree on the property as a warning to the others. He fought the Cox on an Indian reservation near his home where the laws of Mississippi don't apply. Most of his sales of the Cox go to illegal Mexicans who carry over the tradition from the home country. They love it, man. Can't get enough, he told me. They got me on all kinds of pills, you know, he continued. I've never been exactly stone sober since before I got out. Is that all you're on, I asked him. The pharmaceuticals, I mean. He grinned. I've been taking just about everything I can get my hands on. Street pharmaceuticals, whatever, he chuckled. It really is rough over there, isn't it? I said stupidly, thinking out loud. He laughed. Shit, man, that part was easy. Over there, I knew my job, and I was good at it. I didn't have to worry about bills, what I was going to make for dinner. The enemy was clear. He was the guy shooting at me and my brothers. I only had to focus on staying alive. Over there, all the bullshit is cut out. Life is just having to survive. Petty shit didn't matter like it does here. It's coming back here is the hard part. Over here I gotta worry about being evicted if I don't pay the bills. Over here I gotta fit in this consuming, selfish society. No one knows what I did over there, he said, gazing out over the force. And they don't care, and now that I'm back, it's hard to tell who the fucking enemies are. The bad guys here aren't shooting at me. Here they sit behind big desks and expensive suits at the bank when I try to get a loan, or, or they stand there with their arms folded when I try explaining how I could just use a break. They blend in with everyone else, and the enemies over there are harder to recognize too now that I'm removed from it. I gotta keep telling myself what we did over there, what I did over there. What we're still doing over there is, is right. I can't live thinking what I did over there was a waste. I had to tell myself it was worth it all. I don't got a choice. Trey's hands began to tremble, but he notices and tucked into his jacket pocket before I could ask about it. Something inside me shattered then, something which was already cracked. I should never have been a part of this, I told myself. It kills me to see someone I love in the shape he's in. Trey had been a gung-ho person his whole life. He was always wound tight. The reason he was in the military to begin with was because he was caught selling weed in high school and given the ultimatum between jail time and the army. He chose the army, but he doesn't deserve this, I remember telling myself. No one deserves this, to be used up and left out alone, utterly reeling from the fall. I can't be a part of something that does this to anyone, no matter the side. I can't, I argued. Suddenly, the war became concrete for me. The abstraction's now solidified. A fog descended I haven't been able to shake since. Returning to Boston Spa and the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, I resolved to start the process of actually trying to get myself relieved from active duty with an honorable discharge. I set up a meeting with the yeoman regarding the application for receiving conscience objector status, a designation placed on some people upon, due to their spiritual belief regarding the sacredness of human life, disallowing harm or death to another person. When the day comes, I find the yeoman to be a nice guy. He wears black rimmed glasses and has large Sailor Jerry tattoos stitched along his arms, pinup girls wearing navy uniforms and sailing ships flying banners, sea monsters and anchors. I've never seen one of these go through, just so you know, he tells me outright, but I'll try my best to help you along the way. He goes over the paperwork on the fell out to put the process in motion. He tells me I'll have to build a case for myself, much like an attorney, with corroborating evidence showing beyond a doubt that my belief against harming another human being for any reason is contradictory to my moral obligations. Normally in these situations, the person trying to prove oneself can lean on letters and statements from spiritual leaders or fellow church members. But I don't have any spiritual leaders, and I haven't been to church in years, so it's not an option available to me. The meeting only serves to reiterate how improbable this route will be. 
Instead, my hope being renewed, I feel as though my last option is disintegrated. The earth has crumbled beneath my feet where I fall 500 feet beneath the ocean's surface. The next several weeks are spent with my black polished boots hovering, floating above the steel grated decks of my engine room, the whirring of the steam turbines, the hum of oil pumps, the clicking of meters counting off various plant pressures and temperatures acting as my soundtrack. Time turns on ahead of me, catching me in a slipstream just behind enough to be unable to catch up. I wake up tend to my duties, drive home, and fall asleep without much of anything coming into actual contact with me. The memories of the day glide straight through, much like the unseen gamma radiation from the reactor itself. It's an unseasonably cold night in November, and sleep won't come to me. Something forces me to get dressed and leave the apartment, which I rarely do. It makes me walk the streets of my little town. The cold doesn't faze me. My phone rings, but I don't pay it any mind. I can see myself from behind as though I'm walking a few steps back. I watch myself, the silvery mist exiting my lips to wrap about my head before dissipating into the air. My phone rings again. The vibration of it carries through my thigh. I continue to follow me around the block back to my building's door and up the two flight of stairs and into the bathroom where I can see myself shutting the door. The light is on, but I don't recall if I turned it on. My phone rings again. It's my father. I press a silent button and the vibration stops. Four missed calls, the screen reads. I can see my hand reach up to the shelf beside the mirror. I watch my fingers lift the straight razor my roommate uses to keep the nape of his neck clean. Without a sense of feeling at all, I observe myself open the razor placing its surgical edge against the bluest twists of veins within my wrist, and then I hear the vibration of the phone against the ceramic sink. I look down, this time inside myself, and I see that it is again my father. Still holding the razor in my leading hand, I slowly pick up the phone after a few rings. Hello? Hey, son. My father's familiar voice trails off. Hey, Dad. It's Trey, he says. Silence. Son? Yeah, Dad? Trey shot himself. Is he... No, he's been lifted to the hospital. They say he's gonna make it. Silence. We're uh, hoping you can make it down here. Seeing you, well, it would... I know it'd make him feel better. With four days off between my shifts, I get a plane ticket to Memphis where my brother picks me up from the airport with a glowing smile and a hug lasting longer than I'm used to. After a night spent at my mother's, my brother drops me off at the entrance of the hospital where Trey's being treated. There I speak to a nurse and she directs me to the ICU. Trey's father, Uncle Mark, sits on the floor against the wall smiling faintly as I walk to him. His face is sagging beneath the heaviness of sleepless nights. His eyes are blackened. How is he? He's doing great after the shit he pulled, he says. I should have told you. He'll be going to surgery here in a little while. He blew part of his tongue out. He's on a lot of morphine. Can he talk? He tries to talk, he says. He's been singing. He leads me in exhausted shuffle to Trey's room. He's got really excited when I told him you were coming, he tells me. He stays outside the door as I enter. I find Trey sitting up in bed, legs stretched, smiling as best he can as I walk in. Hey, cuz, he slurs with upturned inflection. Hey, Trey. How are you, man? I'm fucked up, isn't it obvious, he says, smiling through his eyes because his mouth won't cooperate. His speech comes out mushed and drunken, but I'm able to make out some of what he's trying to say. His face is bloated and highlighted yellow as shadows of bluish-purple bruising. He wears a metal halo, a cylindrical cage around his face, screwed straight to his skull to prevent any movement of his neck. The force of the bullet broke his neck in two places. They haven't been able to bathe him properly since he got here because of the risk involved in moving him 
so he uses a suction tube to clean himself. His saliva, snot, sweat, the thick oil excreting from his pores. His skin has a fluorescent sheen to it from the glaze of the stuff. My eyes follow the journey of his murky fluids through a transparent rubber tube from the vacuum he holds in his hand, through the air, collected finally inside a clear plastic jar filled with a liquid the color of yellowed bile mounted above his head onto the white wall behind him. The sucking sound of the tube against his skin pierces worse than any dissonant tone. He speaks in a garbled mess like a three-year-old trying to tell a story, so he asked me to hand over a whiteboard lying on the stand next to the table. I uncap the marker and situate the board upon his lap. He has a difficult time holding the navy blue marker and I have to reposition it between his fingers of his right hand more than once. His words are hard to make out as his handwriting is nearly as garbled as his speech. I have to reread the scarbled lines over and over again before I'm able to decipher them. I've been rapping for the nurses, he writes, right before launching into some ridiculous, incoherent freestyle about who knows what, as only the syllables and a specific rhythm are detectable. I'm laughing the whole time more than I have in a long while. He keeps rhythm by drum along on the chrome bed railing. It's ridiculous. He writes how he's been hallucinating on the morphine he controls via pump with his left hand. He briefly describes surreal scenes of fantastical creatures and dream world happenings. His brain tricks him sometimes into believing a halo is a chain link fence his head is caught in. He writes of hearing the voices of the nurses gossiping and his mind blending them in with his memory, building shitty soap operas he can't escape. Devil playing on my trigger, he writes. Angels, scared, deserted me, don't understand, they're automated. Don't know how it is to be God's experiment, guinea pigs with habit and conscience. Grief, truth. He points to himself with a marker before writing, still here. When the nurses comes to prep him for surgery, casually offering something ineffective, don't worry, everything's going to be fine, she's telling him. There's nothing to worry about. She's making an honest effort at resting his nerves, but a switch in his brain throws and he lights up. He pushes her with strength I wouldn't expect him capable of, and he starts frantically pulling at the IV in his arm. I don't know what to do. I'm helpless. I stand frozen, witnessing the scene as if I'm somewhere else watching it. He jerks the needle from his veins, causing blood to run in trickles down his arms and onto the clean sheets before splatting abstract forms on the dustless white tiles below. Trey tears the electrical monitors from his chest and from his temples. He's screaming, and for the first time I'm able to make out, at least I imagine I can. Stop! Stop! My dogs! My dogs! He's killing them! He's gonna fucking kill them all! He's seeing blood around the room. He's yelling something about a horrific worm eating his roosters alive, struggling to explain to the staff the triggers aren't working on any of his guns. He's trying like hell to fight a war unfolding within his mind, and all I can do is stand there, open mouth and wide-eyed, watching the nurses freak out. The nurse who'd been shoved has picked herself from the floor and is now crying, her body lamp and trembling against the wall. The doctor runs in with another nurse, yells for me to leave and from outside the room, through the glass, my uncle and I watch the doctor strains to pin Trey's upper body to the bed, shouting coarse commands for one nurse to hold the legs for the other to go get some medicine I've never heard of. The new nurse runs in from the room, returning a few minutes later, rat unwrapping a needle from a... The new nurse runs from the room, returning a few moments later, unwrapping a needle from its sterilized plastic, her face changing to iron as she plunges the needle into Trey's jugular, stopping, pushing the stopper down, injecting him with calm. She then inches away and watches, taking her place beside the first nurse, still against the wall, staring straight-faced and drained, the front of her uniform speckled crimson, Pollock-like with blood. Almost immediately, Trey recedes. His breathing slows as his eyes collapse into shallow holes. The surgery is rescheduled. 
I walk down the hallway with Uncle Mark. I'm the only one who can really figure out what he's saying, Uncle Mark says. Just like when he was a toddler. From, from what I've been able to make out, he was playing Russian roulette with this homeless kid who's been coming around his place. He told me this kid came over with a gun and was talking about wanting to kill himself, so Trey, he decides he's going to scare it out of him. Said he told the guy they were going to play a game. He said he put two bullets in the gun, spun the chamber, put it to his temple, and pulled the trigger. And when nothing happened, he handed it to the other guy, but the guy was too scared, so he put it in his mouth and... Uncle Mark demonstrates with his finger, throwing his head back in an act he's probably been continuing playing out in his head since it happened. He then turns and looks me straight in the eyes, his gaze commanding mine. Trey said he knew he would save him, the kid. His eyes dropped to the floor. Here I thought worrying about him dying stopped when he came back. I never imagined this. Upon my return to New York, I sit with my advisor, chief of the plant, and I tell him about what's happened with Trey and about my decision to apply for conscience objective status. He seems to care about what I'm saying, asking me straight away, have you had suicidal thoughts? Uh, well, I slipped not having expected the question. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it. I want to take you to the hospital so they can ask you some questions, just to see if everything's all right, he says, grabbing his jacket. Can we do that? I nod. The next morning, as instructed, I see the base counselor, a pudgy, balding, middle-aged man named Joe Ashner, who grew up in the city, a civilian, thankfully. He sits behind a cluttered desk behind a bookshelf lined with psychology manuals. He gazes out through large, unfashionable glasses wrapped in a disheveled blue sweater vest, khakis, and worn brown loafers. He smiles when I enter. He introduces himself with a moist handshake as I sit across from him, avoiding his eyes. He knows where I'm here. He knows why I'm here and begins by asking general questions about my life, where I'm from, my age, my interest. In your own words, can you tell me why you're here, he asks. I don't belong here, I tell him. I made a mistake and now I'm finding it difficult to live with a decision. He nods. Then he asks me if I read and we begin to talk about books and authors. I tell him I've been reading Kierkegaard. How I understand what he means when he says an either or. I say of my sorrow what the Englishman says of his house. My sorrow is my castle. Joe puts down his notebook and tries to lighten my mood. He asks if I listen to music and I nod. He tells me how he loves jazz, especially the standards. Miles Davis, Charles Mingus, Charlie Parker, and though I love and I and though I share his love of them, I don't feel like talking. Have you thought about medications to help? I'm not gonna take the meds, I tell him. He nods. Over the next few weeks, through the dream state, st over the next few weeks, though the dream state still holds sway over me, bringing with them a numbness I find hard to shake, and though the agoraphobia continues to coax me to remain beneath the familiar weight of my covers, I now hear the imagined words of Trey to the homeless kid echoing through my head. You don't deserve death. You're just a fucking coward. The words help to ground me in some way. Help me to place myself inside myself. My sessions with my counselor Joe begin to become the highlight of my week. I start to feel again. Sadness mostly, but any feeling is welcome at this point. And then at the end of one of our sessions, Joe, with uncharacteristic professionalism, seriously staring into my eyes, tells me, I have determined that due to conflicting with your moral beliefs, your involvement with the military is producing such stress upon you that it has affected your mental state to such a degree that it has placed your well-being in jeopardy. You are not fit for duty, which places both you and those around you at risk. Since you refuse medication, the only course of action we have is to let you go. It is necessary for your improvement. I'm going to write a recommendation for you to see the Navy's head psychology department in Groton. I'm going to recommend you be discharged as soon as possible. We will see if they agree. 
we share a smile. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to stop there. Uh, you can read the rest at the Wrath Bearing Tree. Um, thank you guys for joining. I hope you guys are staying healthy and keeping sane. And I'll see you soon. Thanks.